Hey everyone, welcome to this week's episode of A Different Atheist Reads. Last Thursday, I mentioned I needed more time to prepare the lecture, and what I have in front of me is 56 slides that we're going to get through. So what I think I'm going to do is record this and put it as a two-parter, and I'm going to put out part two as soon as I can after part one, like hopefully within the next 12 hours, the day or whatever, and uh, get, basically give you a double episode uh, and then take next week off because this was a lot of work and I've got a lot of content. So you have a choice. You can watch half the part one now and then watch part two right away and you'll have everything, or you can watch part one and then wait till next Next week and wrap it up. Either way, I'm getting you two episodes, so enjoy them how you will. What I'd like to do today is present a synthesis of information that I think is relevant to Karen's chapter. A lot of this is going to come from the Yale lecture series on the New Testament that I mentioned last time, but all the parts of it is also just the accumulation of, you know, 15 years of me being interested in early uh, Christian theology and that time period. So what I'm going to be doing here is not just parroting information from a source or redoing a lecture I've already seen. Instead, I'm constructing my own arguments from the spectrum of, of sources that I've encountered. And every assertion that I'm going to be giving you will be backed up by evidence, and either it will be textual evidence or it will be, um, you know, a scholar who's written a book on it that I will provide links for. So I want to be very clear and transparent about what my evidence is and where it comes from. As I said in the last video, the setup today is that I'm going to take the position that the idea of an historical Jesus is the most probable um, explanation of all the evidence we have. So in terms of the, my imagined opponent, if it were, someone who was going to argue that there was never a Jesus and he never existed, then what I would ask that person to do is, of the points I'm going to put out, where is the evidence you see to support your position that a non-existent person is a reasonable conclusion based on the evidence at hand? In this video, I will present evidence about the attributes and nature of Jesus and how they changed in what I see as a progressive direction over the decades. I will then also present why I think that this progressive Christology is evidence for an historical Jesus. And in the course of this video, I will direct questions to mythicists, and by that I mean those people who take up the position that there was no, Jesus is purely fictional. First, what do I mean by an historical Jesus? This is obviously something we need to define early on in order for me to be clear about what I am defending here in terms of being the most reasonable conclusion. And what I think happened is the most reasonable conclusion is that a man named Yeshua, who came from the Galilee and lived in the first century CE, gathered a sect of Jewish followers. He himself was Jewish. He preached Judaism in the early years of the first century, and he was eventually um, captured or you know, arrested and, and killed by the Romans for sedition or treason. So in my mind, Jesus is as much an historical figure as the Buddha, even though there are a lot of myths and legends attached to him, or other people like Alexander or Socrates. So uh, obviously, though, this does not mean I think he had supernatural powers. I, I don't. I just think he was a man who maybe people thought he had supernatural powers, and maybe even he believed he had supernatural powers, but just believing something doesn't make it true. So I don't accept anything supernatural about Jesus, just that there was a man in history who um, preached to these people who lit, became his later followers and the missionaries. What I'm going to do in this video is give uh, an exegesis of the canonical text that we have about Jesus. Now, exegesis just means a critical explanation or interpretation of a text, particularly religious texts. The time period that I want to cover is from 40 CE to about 120 CE, so we're only going to get up to John, John's Gospel, in this lecture. And I'm not going to do um, engage with any of the non-canonical texts. Um, I will talk about Gnosticism in, in the next section. The questions that I'm going to ask of each of these texts is kind of basic. What does the author, how does the author treat Jesus as if he was a real person or not? And given the depiction of Jesus and the things the author makes, says about Jesus and the claims they make, he makes, is it uh, plausible that he thought it was a real person? Like, is it, like, does it match the characteristics of the theology that a real person would do these things? Or does it, you know, and I'm not going to take up the, 
how would it make sense if he didn't exist? Because I don't think it makes sense if he didn't exist. So that's why I'm defending the historical position. In Karen's book that she goes over um, a lot of different ideas about Jesus. And I want to do it, but again, I'm going to do it from my own perspective. So when I talk about progressive Christologies and the historical Jesus, I'm not going to start with the Christian writings. We're going to start with the Jewish writings and monotheism and Jewish mythology. Then I want to look a little bit at Daniel and how the in invent uh, the introduction of the apocalyptic notion of God's actions in the world was rising in the first century Jewish thought that would have been around Jesus and we can actually see in the Gospel of Mark as being cited the abomination of desolation. I also want to present you a diagram on Christology so that we can as we move through this lecture plot out the various forms of Christologies or Christologies that people have and which texts map onto which debates. And you'll see that there's really just two main divisions. There are people who thought Jesus was always human and there are people who thought he was human and divine. So those are the two the two kinds of, hair, of, of opinions that people have about Je Jesus' messiahship, those are the two axes on which they all fall. Then we're going to look at the pre-Pauline texts. So the texts that are not in Paul's letters but seem to have originated even before Paul became uh, an apostle he, because he cites um, passages that explain a theology that contradicts Paul's theology. So it, in his letter to the Romans, he certainly seems to be reciting a prayer that would be in common, so that means it preceded him. I then want to look at Q, and insofar as historians have been able to identify what passages are in Q, I want to look at whether or not we have a lot of miracle stories and magic and supernatural things happening in Q, or if we have sayings, or a mix of those two things. Then we're going to look at Mark, Matthew, Luke, and Acts in one, and John, and then we're going to be done. To review from chapter two, with the exclusion of the Gospel of John, really all of the other authors of the Gospels and Paul's letters that are authentic were either Jewish or they accepted Jews were, Jews were bound by the law, that Gentiles weren't, but Jews would culturally engage in Jewish practices because that's their practices. When you read the Gospels and when you read Paul's authentic letters, and probably his inauthentic ones too, but I'm just dismissing those because they're not authentic, we see a lot of mythology in them. But it's fundamentally, I would argue, Jewish mythology that is contained within these texts. So let's put ourselves back in the Jewish mindset we saw in the last chapter, just to remember what the Jewish beliefs about Yahweh were. We saw in chapter 2 that the overarching theme of ancient Jewish worship of, is the otherness of Yahweh. Right? God was other and humans were profane. And that's common, right? We tend to use the word profane negatively, but here it just means not holy. We saw how there were special rituals of purity where the degrees of purity needed to approach the presence of God increased and were higher and raised. And actually there were certain times of the year that were the most holy that you would use um, to actually go into the presence of God. So clearly there's this massive division. While Yahweh is holy and immortal and eternal, humans are ordinary mortal and sexual. So these clear differences exist between beings. We do have, let's say, a little vestigial tale of um, perhaps some possibility of, of um, interbeing relationships back in Genesis where there's this one throwaway line about like angels coming down and having sex with women but that's never picked up on in the rest of the text. I think there's one mention of it in David when they talk about the Nephilim or something. But really, there are the roots in Judaism for the notion of human and divine beings through reproduction existing, at least the seed of it. But over thousands and thousands of years, no one picks up on it. And it's still not picked up on. That's why we point it out, because it's so weird. So um, we saw that there is this very clear distinction between the holy and human. We also saw that the ritual purity laws are not about hygiene and they're not about sanitation. What they are 
in the practices, when you look at it from an anthropological perspective, it's about sex and death. So discharges from the genitalia or being near someone who is dead. All of these were considered, again, reminders of what human beings were not. They were not eternal. They were not um, asexual. They are sexual, dying, you know, mortal beings. So the ritual purity laws were really designed to get people closer to the state of God because we're not it is other. So it's an emulation, it's not a union. The other thing I want to say about the Jewish texts themselves that we should remember is that the authors who are writing them were the like a cult of Yahweh. They were the most fundamental religiously conservative guys around. I kind of think of them as being the Pat Robertsons of their day. They're always moaning on about how everybody's sinning and, and you've got to, you know, give your heart to God. And if you don't, he's going to rain down, um, you know, terrible floods and judgment upon you. And these were the right wing kind of like religious fundamentalists of their day trying to get people who were Jewish practitioners of their religion to stop engaging in idolatry. So the whole motivation, uh, one of the themes that comes up again and again in the Jewish texts uh, is idolatry is terrible and there is only one God and it's Yahweh and you have one way to worship him, this is the appropriate way. And we know that there were a lot of Jews out there who were practicing what's called synchronism, which was a union of blending of religions. Or they would dabble a bit in Jewish stuff and they would go and do idol, you know, just cover the bases and do some stuff to Baal and other people too. And we know this because the authors keep banging on about how bad this is and how much God doesn't like it. So I'm not saying those practices, those synchronistic practices weren't happening in the culture, clearly they were. What I'm saying is the people who were following the texts of these fundamentalist Yahwehists the exclusion, exclusionary Yahwehist cult wouldn't be doing those things. They couldn't be doing those things. It's actually fundamentally against their teachings to be tolerant and incorporate a lot of pagan ideas into their religion. The last thing I want to talk about is the idea of Jewish mythology. And I want to point out there is a vast amount of Jewish mythology that the authors of the text had access to. We had mythical people who were mistakenly to assume to have been real. So in terms of like a mythical, you know, Jesus versus an historical Jesus, I think there's no evidence at all to support an historical Moses or an historical Abraham. I am looking at the text, they just read like they're myths. You don't know where he died and his gravestone is lost. Oh, and you know, there's no physical events that you can actually go visit um, to tie to these people. So even though they're clearly mythical, the authors of the Jewish text believe they were real people. They talk about them as real people. They attribute authorship to them. Jesus said that Moses wrote, you know, the Torah, which clearly cannot be true. So we have all of these characters, uh, Abraham, Jacob, Moses, um, Adam, and all of the ones that go along with it. We have the mythical events, the Genesis, Flood, Exodus, giving of the law, the establishing of the covenant, and these kind of ritual, mythological, cultural, religious ideas that were floating around and available to the authors of the Christian texts. The other thing that we should remember are the number of miracles that are performed in the Jewish scriptures. You have Moses who is controlling the water and parting the water of the Sea of Reeds. You also have the water coming from the rock. You have him feeding the multitudes, right? God be like, we're hungry, and Moses has a miracle and, and they um, you know, all pick up foam off the ground or something, it's manna. Then you've got uh, Elijah doing 16 different miracles. In the case of Elijah, um, you've got food miracles, you have resurrection miracles, calling fire from the heavens, parting of the Jordan, being caught up in a whirlwind. So these mythical ideas uh, can be traced back to the Jewish texts. So now that we have this mental mindset that we can use to approach the first century when these texts are starting to be written, Div um, Yahweh is divine and other, idolatry is intolerable, we can read the text um, as being by and preferred, uh, being of and preferred by Jewish fundamentalists and the people who won't tolerate idolatry. And everything about the Jewish culture that we see puts it out of step with its pagan neighbors. Its beliefs were exclusivist. They had their own distinctive and clothing rituals. They had special rights to practice monotheism under the Romans. 
you know, they can kind of see them as being in the pagan world, but not of it. The last thing I want to mention before we move on to our analysis is Daniel and the book of Daniel and its influence and importance in understanding the apocalyptic nature of the message of some of the Gospels. Daniel was clearly a popular text in the early Jesus movement. The Gospel of Matthew and Mark both use the term the abomination of desolation, which is from the um, Daniel explicitly. In the first century, we see evidence that there were a lot of different Jewish responses to the Roman occupation, some violent, some um, re religiously revolutionary. And we have evidence that there were people who believed that a military revolt wasn't the answer, but that God would intervene miraculously in human history and send in angels or heavenly host down to Jerusalem and create a, a new city after defeating um, Antiochus and establishing a new kingdom in Israel. That's basically where you get the story of that. It's from Daniel. I said that was last. There's one more thing. I just want to mention that, that another reason why I think an historical Jesus is quite probable is because there were a lot of other failed messiahs before him and after him. So we have a whole bunch of guys in the first century who believed that they were the messiah. There's a guy named Simon about the fourth century BCE, a former slave who rebelled and was killed by the Romans. There was another one, I think it's Eth. Rognus, who was a shepherd who turned, uh, was turned, became a leader of a rebellion. He was eventually killed by the Romans. There was Jesus, who was in the Galilee. He was killed by the Romans. There's Judas of Galilee, who in the, around 6 CE led a violent resistance to the census, and that revolt was crushed by the Romans. There's another person called Menhem, I think, uh, the grandson of, a, of Judas of Galilee. He was, um, he was actually killed by one of his own men, so he's sort of the outlier. There's someone called, uh, I think it's called Thetis, a Jewish rebel of the first century who at some point got a lot of followers and he was killed by the Romans. And another guy named John who is in, from a place I can't pronounce sometime after this, the 70s. And he was also he, um, paraded, in this case, he was paraded through the streets of Roman chains. So he was defeated by the Romans. So Jesus is pretty typical for as far as messiahs go. Now that we've highlighted influences on the Pharisees and Judaism, the Jewish mindset, the idea of apocalyptic powers of God coming down, and also the, the idea that there are a lot of failed messiahs around, we can start to look at the Christologies. And a Christology is simply anything that concerns the details of Jesus' ministry, his acts, and his teaching, and trying to present an idea of who he was and what his role was in salvation. So now I'm going to show you a slide that I've created that shows you the big axis between um, the, the two kinds of areas where we had beliefs of Christology. There's one which is the human axis, and then the other one is really the interesting one. And on that one, I've got uh, it broken up into two camps, a man who became divine, or was Jesus always divine? And you can see on the man who became divine, there were three different opinions on when he became divine. When he died, was resurrected, and then ascended into heaven, and he became uh, divine on his ascension. There were other passages in the Bible where it seems to indicate that Jesus became divine at his resurrection. And we have uh, the Gospel of Mark that shows that there was no pre-existent Jesus, he becomes divine and his baptism. That's, so we'll, we'll go into more detail on those. On the other one, we've got when did he, um, Jesus was always divine, so if he was always divine, when did he emerge? There's the idea that he was born and then became divine, or he always existed and became, took a human form. The last bit there on human and divine and human appearing as divine is going to be the difference between orthodoxy and Gnosticism. So let's go. The question I want to ask after every section is, what does the text say about Jesus, or what view of Jesus does the author present? And then ask, given the view, does the interpretation make sense if the author was convinced there was an historical Jesus? So the challenge I would issue then for each of these points for mythicists would be the same. Uh, does the interpretation make sense if the author was convinced there was no historical Jesus?
the first people to believe in Jesus were Jews. So Jewish Christians um, would not have thought that Jesus was divine it, because um, that is incompatible with their belief systems. But we have a lot of evidence that there were Jews who thought Jesus' messiahship was compatible with Judaism. So according to Alistair McGrath, the Jewish Christians affirmed every aspect of then contemporary Second Temple Judaism with the addition of the belief that Jesus was the Jewish Messiah or the Messiah. Right? Um, and we have evidence of this in Acts when Paul is goes to Jerusalem and there's a rumor he's been teaching against the law and he's forced to actually engage in Jewish laws and go to the temple. Acts 21:12. And they said to him, You see, brother, how many thousands there are among the Jews of those who have believed, and they are all zealous for the law. And they are told about you that, you know, you're telling people not to walk in the customs of Moses. So clearly there are, um, there is, the Jewish movement is the initial movement that starts from um, the Jesus movement off. And so we're going to put that, the pre-Pauline bits, over there in the human camp. In terms of historicity check, is it possible? It's completely, obviously we have evidence that it was possible to be a human male and a messiah and not be divine. That's kind of like actually what the messiah is supposed to be when you look at Judaism. And that was when my battery ran out. <laughs> That's what happened. Um, I was recording and got to about slide, what are we on here? Slide 29 and the battery just died on me. So I had to charge it up and here we're back again. So let's get going with the next set of Christologies. The concept that I want to introduce here is adoptionism. And that is um, the idea that Jesus was adopted as God's son, either at his baptism, resurrection, or his ascension. In the pre-Pauline text, we can see this adoptionalist theology when we read Acts uh, 2. This is a speech that is attributed to Peter, but in it he's talking to um, his audience, and he says, seeing what was to come, he spoke of the resurrection, so he's talking about David here, he spoke of the resurrection of the Messiah, that he was not abandoned to the realm of the dead, nor did his body see decay. God has raised this Jesus to life, and we are all witnesses of it. Exalted to the right hand of God, he has received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit. Da, 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 da. Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus, whom you have crucified, both Lord and Messiah. So obviously here you don't have a pre-existent Jesus, you don't have a divine Jesus. What you have is a man who was elevated to a status by God. And that is what adoptionism is. Another example can be found in Romans 1 where Paul writes about the gospel concerning his son who was descended from David according to the flesh and designated son of God in power according to the spirit of holiness by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord. So you can see here that Paul is connecting David's messianic prophecies about ruling in the holy city as a physical descent, not a inherited one that's, you know, so he's talking about according to the flesh. And he's also saying that Jesus was designated. He was given his title. It wasn't inherited by him. So that doesn't work if he wasn't God. And it's also really difficult to understand how that would work if he wasn't a, hu a human being who really existed to be raised up by God, in my opinion. One other example of God raising Jesus up can be found in Ephesians, where it is written, the, Paul writes, um, which he brought about in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places. So again, here you definitely have a, a situation where God is higher and he is actually raising a dead man up and seating him at his right hand. So I'll just let that stand with my last comment. And you can, I've given um, on this next slide, 
a little note that according to the Ebionites, the group believe that Jesus was chosen because his, of his sinless devotion to the will of God. So then what we're going to do here is we're going to put Acts at the ascension of Jesus and we're going to put Romans and Ephesians at his resurrection. So again, these are different Christologies in terms of Jesus' human and divine nature. Historicity check. So what does this text say about Jesus or the view that it presents? Well here clearly God has raised this Jesus to life. Um, God is the one with power. Jesus is not the one with power. Um, Jesus is being elevated, exalted, designated. He is always on the receiving end of these things. And again, I'm not entirely convinced that this can be a plausible theology if you don't think this ever happened or this man never, God existed, but this man didn't exist. I think it makes entirely perfect sense if you think that there was a guy who died and people had to explain it. So they made it magic that when he died, he actually became closer to God. I think that's really plausible because we see that happening all the time. The next text we're going to look at is Q. Now Q is an inferred text. It's not one that you can go and buy in a bookstore. But for those of you who don't know, they identify parts of Q by, they know for instance that Luke and Matthew both used Mark as a source. And then there are passages in both Luke and Matthew that are nearly or actually identical because obviously they changed a bit, both the authors of Luke and Matthew, when they were writing their own versions of it. And, and so all of the material that they can see is almost exact in Luke and Matthew, but does not appear in Mark. They hypothesize comes from an, a different source. And that can be constructed in many ways, but it contains mostly, you know, the same passages because of where they're identified in. And these were written sometime between 40 and 80 CE. He was basically a sayings source. It's a, a lot of quotes that uh, can be as assembled and put together. It's teachings, it's things like the Beatitudes um, and other things that we commonly associate with the life of Jesus. What it is not is a series of miraculous events or a series of um, yeah, supernatural events, Jesus doing things supernaturally. Apparently there is a, one healing that is identified in Q, and that's the centurion's service, uh, servant, sorry, and um, there are, they discuss in the Q dis dialogues that Jesus is a miracle worker, worker. but Q is not a miracles um, gospel, it's a sayings gospel, and that is why um, I think that it makes a lot more sense that a person would say things and that would be the basis of a sayings gospel. And a non-existent being would have stories made up about it, him doing things. And so again, I'm not aware of any historical texts that are sayings and you know proverbs and other little teachings that are attributed to somebody who does not exist at all. I'm very familiar with sayings from people who do exist. The next author we're going to look at is Paul, who wrote between 50 and in the early 60s of the Common Era. Now, Paul's theology is really, really complicated, and we don't have enough time for it. But in terms of this question, what I want to focus on is what did he write about Jesus, and what did um, his earliest gospel say about his belief in Jesus? And for that, we're going to look at a passage in Thessalonians. What did Paul believe about Jesus? That's a lot harder to put together than even what an historic Jesus is because Paul doesn't say a lot about Jesus the person. He's far more interested in spreading his own personal gospel. But he does mention him a few times and when he does, he does indicate that he has an opinion that it was an earthly Jesus that he is writing about. So he says in Romans 1, Paul, a bondservant of Christ Jesus, called as an apostle, set apart, blah, 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 um, concerning his son, who was born a descendant of David according to the flesh, who was declared the son of God with power by res the resurrection from the dead according to the spirit of holiness. So this again, we saw in the last one when we were talking about Jesus getting his uh, powers when he ascended. This is an indication that Paul was thinking of Jesus as an earthly, fleshly descendant of David.
this isn't the only time that Paul talks about Jesus as being a real person or Jesus' body. Because remember, what really becomes the central theme of heresy is what was the nature of Jesus' body and what was the nature of his divinity. So Paul here writes, I can't find out which passage it was, but here's the quote. For if the many died by the transgress of one man, how much more did God's grace and the gift that came by the grace of one man, Jesus Christ, dot, 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 dot. For if by the trespasses of one man death reigned through that one man, how much more will those who receive God's abundant provision of grace and the gift of righteousness reign in the life through the one man, Jesus Christ? Then he goes, blah, 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 blah. Um, for just as through the disobedience of the one man, the many were made sinners, so also through the obedience of the one man will many be made righteous. Paul didn't think Adam was a hypothetical or a mythical person. He didn't think Abraham didn't exist. He firmly believed Moses exist and existed. And so uh, it would be, it's impossible for me to see how he could write this comparing Adam who he thought existed to a man he didn't. But it does make sense to me if it was an historical Jesus that he was writing about. Another thing that I think is very much evidence in favor of an historical Jesus is what Paul was actually teaching. Now this is um, a bit shocking to me um, it, that he actually got away with this kind of stuff, but in the Dale Martin lecture he talks about the way Paul, not Dale Martin, how the way Paul gets away with this stuff, um, the way that Paul is writing here to his early church. So Paul went to Thessaloniki, he gained a few followers, and after he established his church he went on his way. Now, apparently what Paul was teaching these people was that there was a guy named Jesus who had just died. He was the, um, the, the Messiah of the Jewish God. The Jewish God was going to come back any day now and open the skies, intervene in human history, establish a kingdom um, in Jerusalem, establish a good kingdom, and that Gentiles, although right now because they didn't know about Jesus, couldn't participate, but if they did acknowledge Jesus as the Son of God, then they would get to go to the party too, right? And it was happening anytime now, so you have to convert, because if you want to go to the party, you've got to be ready. And he converted a whole bunch of people to his version of Christianity with some kind of gospel like this. And we know this because Paul left and people are like, okay, you know, Jesus is coming, it's going to be any day now, this is going to be awesome, we're going to learn how to be Christians uh, and, and be all ready for when Jesus comes and everything's going to be better. The poor are going to be raised, the rich are going to be brought down, everything's going to be cool. And weeks go by, months go by, maybe even years go by, but what happens is some of the members of the church start to die and people in the church freak out because Paul has not told them what happens after death. And so they start to get really worried that their friends and family are now, because they're dead, they're not going to be able to participate in the kingdom because they're not going to be alive for when Jesus comes. Because apparently, yes, there's no belief of an afterlife in Paul's gospel. And we know that because he has to write them a letter and explain to them what happens after they die. So very, very quickly, I'll read this over. But we would not have you ignorant, brethren, concerning them that fall asleep that ye sorrow not, even as the rest who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them that are also fallen asleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we are alive, that are left unto the coming of the Lord, shall in no wise precede them that are fallen asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, and with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first, then we that are alive, that are left, shall together with them be caught up in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, our comfort one another with these words." Um, so yeah, Paul was converting people to a religion, and they were expecting the end to come, and they had no idea what happened after you died. And again, be, this to me is really powerful evidence that there must have been an historical Jesus because if you went around making these kinds of claims that somebody didn't exist and you were trying to sell this, I don't see how you, know, you could really get people convinced that the dead were going to come back to life and be with them. These are all, you know, I think about the people on the, who committed suicide when the comet came through, 
you know. They didn't commit suicide before the comet showed up. They actually waited and saw the comet themselves, you know. And so I think when it's this, I don't understand the psychological justification for how you could convert to this religion thinking that the man you're believing in never existed. What do Paul's texts say about his view of Jesus? Well, I would say that Paul clearly describes Jesus as a human being. He talks about him as a human being, and his theology actually requires that Jesus was a human being because he connects him to Adam and the sin coming out of Adam and the sin being redeemed through Jesus. He also, um, his gospel assumes that a real person elevated by Yahweh is going to show up and intervene in human history any minute. So does this interpretation make sense if Paul was convinced there was an historical Jesus? And I think it does. Moving on to Mark's Gospel. Mark's Gospel does not start with a birth narrative. It does not start with any magic or any prophecies or, or any like there's that start with a prophecy, but it doesn't start with any supernaturalism or magic. It starts with the baptism. And that is when Jesus, in this case, is adopted by God as his son. In Mark, you have an adoptionism view that Jesus was the Messiah at his baptism, because that's kind of the only place in his gospel he can become the Messiah. There is also the event of the transfiguration of Jesus, and I think that this is another important area to examine when we look at what people who are Jewish were thinking about Jesus and, and how they regarded him. And in the transfiguration, Jesus has two male visitors who are his peers, Moses and Elijah. And there appeared unto them Elijah with Moses, and they were talking with Jesus. And Peter answered and said to Jesus, Rabbi, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here, and let us make three tabernacles, one for thee, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. This to me is again a location of a Jewish, myth Jewish mystical figures being located with an historical person in order to elevate and provide that historical person credibility. If Mark and his audience had believed that Jesus was divine and a supernatural human being, they would not have given him tabernacles with um, Elijah and Moses. He, they would have given him one with God because he was a God, if you think that that's the perspective people had of Jesus. But that's not what it says in the text. He's right there with the other great heroes of the Jewish traditions, Moses and Elijah. Just want to mention that there are these apocalyptic themes that show up from Daniel and Mark, the idea that God is going to intervene in human history in order to save his people. And it's also important to note that there was no empty tomb story in Mark. Mark's original gospel, as we have it in our earliest and best copies, as the biblical scholars like to say, ends at the empty tomb. So the women go to the tomb, the stone is rolled away, there's a man there, presumably an angel, and he says, go tell the apostles to meet Jesus in Galilee, and the women don't tell anyone uh, because they were afraid. Now we know f if you read all of Mark, there's a whole theme of a reticent messiah and yet his fame grows. So there are ways to reconcile this ending of Mark. But there are no, there is no magical resurrection. It's never narrated. There are no magical appearances in Mark. There are no magical deeds of Jesus flying into the sky. And again, this is the earliest gospel. So if these stories existed, if Jesus was a mythical figure from the earliest gospels written, then I, I, as an historical Jesus proponent, have a very easy time explaining why there is no birth miracle or post-resurrection experiences, and that's because Jesus was a real person who didn't have those miracle things. People were moving his messiahship back from his ascension to his messiahship to now his baptism. So I have a very easy time, but I would like to see what mythicists have to say about how they explain these gaps in Mark if the idea is someone invented Jesus to begin with. Now we're on to Matthew's Gospel, and the scholars estimate that Matthew's Gospel was written sometime between 80 and 100 of the Common Era. It's also known as the Gospel for the Jews, and I'm gonna, I got this little bit off of religious tolerance, but I think it's just easier if I kind of quote from it here. Matthew wrote his Gospel to convince fellow Jews that Jesus was the Messiah foretold in the Old Testament. His Gospel was written from a Jewish viewpoint for a Jewish audience. The internal evidence of this is so overwhelming that it is often called the Gospel for the Jews. 
Matthew's Gospel has far more references and allusions to the Old Testament than any other New Testament book. It systematically identifies Jesus' life with the history of Israel and the book of Israel, or the Hebrew Scriptures. His formula, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet, occurs again and again. And if Mark is writing from a Jewish perspective to a Jewish audience, one, there's no way that he would call Jesus equal to God because that would be blasphemous. And two, he is dealing with people he thinks are historical figures. I, I don't see how you can credibly say that a Jewish author would take a man who never existed and try to put him on par with Moses and Elijah and put him in part as part of the story of Israel. It makes perfect sense to me if there was an historical Jesus and people and he was a Jew and people thought he was the Messiah and Matthew wrote this later. So that is how I see the evidence adding up for an historical Jesus. As we move into Luke Acts, this is a piece of work that scholars estimate was written sometime between 80 and 130 CE. And while Luke and Acts are two separate books, most biblical scholars think they are written by the same author and often treat them as a two-parter. And if you want more information on the evidence for why you should consider Luke Acts one work or two-part work by one author, you can check out the Dale Martin series in the description box. Luke is definitely the most Gentile focused of all of the Gospels and he presents also a view that the law is something that was a cultural and religious practice of Jews and they should keep it, but it wasn't for Gentiles. So with Luke as well you see a compatibilism with Judaism and the early Jesus movement. There are, however, elements of adoptionism in Acts. So for instance in 13, as it is written in the second Psalms, you are my son, today I have become your father. God raised him from the dead so that he will never be subject to decay. Again, it's hard to have a non-existent body decaying. Historicity check. Uh, what does the text say about Jesus and the view of Jesus that is presented? Again in Luke, Jesus is a man born to be the Messiah as directed by Yahweh and his message is for the whole world. And does this make sense if Jesus was an historical person? Yeah, it does. And it also allows for a completely human um, idea of uh, the Messiahship as since Luke's gospel um, is one that sees Judaism as compatible with it. The last text that we're going to deal with now is John. Now John is the most Greek of all of the Gospels, and in my opinion, even it's the most anti-Jewish. Even Matthew, which is considered sometimes anti-Jewish, it's worth remembering when we think back to chapter 2 of A History of God, how often the prophets just yelled at people and told them that they were sinful and how bad they were. So I don't think that Matthew, I think Matthew would be horrified if he knew how people were, were interpreting his text. But with John, he, there is definitely a, an antagonism now that we start to see emerging between the Jesus movement and the Jewish community. And when John is writing, um, the earliest might be in the 90s and then it might go all the way into 120 CE. What we start to see now, almost 100 years after we're getting on a hundred years, at least 60, 60 to 90 years after the death of Jesus, is a final break between the Gentiles and the Jewish community. Now, and in John, um, the author does this by, uh, shows this by putting anachronisms into Jesus' mouth where Jesus talks about you'll be run out of the, the synagogues and things that never happen in his lifetime. So Jesus is um, the most sort of um, anti-Jewish, he's the most Gentile, he's the most influenced by Greek thought, and in John, Jesus pre-existed. He didn't come into being at his birth, like in the Luke story, in the Matthew story, Jesus is born and becomes God when, you know, he's the magical baby that his life starts at that point. Whereas with John, uh, Jesus' divinity pre-existed him. And also with Paul, it seemed like there was some kind of um, notion that Jesus was sort of a, like a, a divine super angel being that pre-existed and then was born and became human and then God elevated him to the special status. Jesus' John is also really weird and not 
very much grounded, I think, in a, in a real person because he just doesn't shut up. He talks and talks and goes on and on. And You compare the Jesus of John to the reticent of Messiah of Mark who's telling people, don't tell them I'm a Messiah. It's a secret. Keep it a secret. Um, this is a completely different Jesus written you know, for a completely different audience. Now, that's not to say there wasn't an historical Jesus. It's just by the time John's writing, he's writing about his theology. He's not writing about the person. There's also this really you know, dodgy closing in, in John that nobody really talks about, but I think is just kind of shows how weak it is in terms of like what the author is trying to do. The very last lines are, and there are also many other things which Jesus did, the which if they should be written every one, I suppose that even the world itself would not contain the books that should be written. That's the kind of stuff I expect in myths. You know, I, I definitely feel like John's Jesus is a, is a creation for a community rather than actually trying to link it back because his aims, the theology of John is quite different from the aim of the Gospels. So now we have the little chart here. I'll put it up. We've got on the far side with a human, we've got the pre-Pauline text in Matthew, which see Jesus is completely human. And then moving on to the divine and human in Axis, we have Acts 2 at his ascension, Romans and Ephesians at his resurrection. We have Mark at his baptism. Kind of skipped over this because the video is getting long, but um, Matthew and Luke don't see Jesus as pre-existent. There's no evidence for that in the text. Instead, what we see is Jesus becoming divine at his birth. And then it's not until we get to John, which is in somewhere in the you know, 90s, hundreds, 110s, that we start to see this idea that Jesus was pre-existent um, and divine. And then the, the bottom two are going to be divine and divine appearing as human. That's going to be orthodoxy and Gnosticism, but we'll get to that in another lecture. Okay, we're done. That was a lot of stuff. Well done you. Well done my battery for not giving out this time. And that is why I think that there was an historical Jesus. Because when I look at the theologies, it always makes sense to me if he really existed and then became a legend. What I do not see any evidence for is that somebody who thought him up when, in a city, where, and they cobbled stuff together and built a religion out of it. That's If you have evidence for that, I'd love to see it. Otherwise, I'm pretty convinced by this. So I would um, like to thank you guys for taking your time and for your patience. This has been a really long video, but a very rich video, and I hope you got a lot out of it. So um, again, this is going to be a two-parter. Now that the battery died, I'm not quite sure I'm gonna, how I'm going to divide it up. But the idea is I'm going to put out parts one and two right away, and then take next week off because this was a lot of work to do <laughs> between the watching and the assembling. So, I've been Christy. You guys are always awesome. Thank you so much, and I'll see you next uh, two weeks' time on A Different Atheist Reads. Bye.